Hey guys, how we doing? Good to hear. There we go. Got a pretty good crew here. All right. Um, yeah. Welcome. Welcome back. I hope you all had a good weekend. Um, so, uh, let's see, what are we up to here? I put up, uh, some solutions, um, for the homework from last week on the website. Check those out. Um, I don't believe you Chung has graded the homework yet, although I'm not hundred percent sure on that, but I will, we're, we're working on that. If not, um, so yeah, uh, I guess. So we got um, we got an exam coming up uh, pretty soon, actually, uh, the final that is. So um, that's on the twentieth. Remember, not the twenty. I mean, there is one on the twenty second, but it's not mine. It's Richard's. So, uh, but just remember that. Um, let me triple check that I've updated that in the syllabus so that we're all clear on that. Uh, as for the exam, uh, yes, okay, so it's on the 20th. So as for the exam, um, the way we're going to do it uh, is basically we're going to have a kind of a 24-hour period for that day uh, when you can do the exam. Um, because some people are in different time zones, and sometimes if you try and do it at one time and you send out like an email to everyone, the email doesn't get sent and it's a disaster. Or like some people get in, some people don't. So it's like there's a lot of like things that can go wrong. Uh, just to sort of prevent all of that, we're gonna do a longer time window. Uh, we're also gonna do, uh, you know, open book, open notes kind of exam. So I'm gonna give you some questions. You can look at your notes. You can look at your book uh, to to help you along uh, with regards to that. Um, I guess yeah. I mean, you can look at like not just the slides and the course notes, but like if you write down stuff, you can look at that too. Um, yeah, so that's that's going to be the nature of the game there. Uh, so, I mean, as a result, I'm not going to give you a, a problem that, I mean, I'm, I was never going to give you a problem that's exactly in the notes anyway. So, but you know, I'm not going to just give you a problem that's right from the notes because that would just, that would be boring. Um, so I'm going to do what I usually do, which is give you kind of a, some variation on a model that we've seen. Uh, in lecture so far okay or uh yeah so so that's the plan um and then i think yeah so i guess i'll just post it on uh on blackboard if that works uh at, at the the start time and then sort of expect you guys to get that in uh also via blackboard um at the finish time okay um yeah, and then obviously, if if there, you know, if you don't get the exam at the, the time you're supposed to get the exam, you should email me right away, and, and so on and so forth. But but because of the the time period, I think it's not super super critical, right? I mean, I'll try and give it to you right on time. But if there are technical issues, then then be sure to let me know. Okay. Um, all right, I think that's it. Um, so I believe Richard is is doing something similar uh, uh, with his exam. I'm not sure about. Um, Re, I'm not sure what he's doing, uh, but he may doing some. He may be doing something similar. Uh, oh, here we go. Got a question from uh, from Gregory. Uh, are there additional references for the Brownian motion and stochastic growth stuff you recommended? Yeah, actually, I just put up some. I just like formally posted the slides that I I'd been uh, working off of that I, I showed a little bit last time on the or last night I did. I posted those on the course website. So I mean, these slides here uh with all this stuff kind of some derivations and so on and so got processes so that that's i think a good one and then in terms of other stuff out there whew, those uh i haven't actually looked in at jamoglu to see if there's stuff on stochastic processes i've, I've looked elsewhere um there might be i'm not sure if there's an appendix in, in at jamoglu but I, I wouldn't be surprised i mean it's a big book. You'd expect there to be a little bit of everything in there. Maybe some uh, scone recipes in, in one of the appendices. Um, 
but uh, I can double check. Uh, I guess yeah, I'm gonna post some practice problems. That's yeah, because like you know, we did we did some expanding variety stuff in the last homework, but we really haven't, we really haven't done practice problems on creative distraction stuff. So uh, you know, I could give you a homework, but you know, I'm just gonna give you some practice problems and like if you want to treat it like a homework and kind of, I mean, you should you should do it. Uh, first without looking at the answers and then I'll just cut out the whole like handing and grading and checking the answers process and you can just skip straight to checking the answers. Okay, so um, so I'll do that soon. I got I got some problems queued up. I just need to wrangle them together into one document and make sure everything makes sense. Um, and then we can do that. So I'll, I'll try and I got to teach later today, but I'll try and post those tonight. Uh, so you guys get cracking on those. All right. Um, on uh, some practice problems that is. So, um, yeah, that's the plan. Today we're going to do some more stochastic processy stuff, uh, Brownian motion, levy flight, and so on. Okay, that's 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 the plan for today. Any questions on um, the home homework or the, or, or forward looking at the exam uh, or anything like that? Okay. Seems like we're good. Uh, yeah, you know the exam. Uh, you should obviously study for it, but it's uh, you got the prelims coming up eventually. So like you know you want you want to treat the exam as a kind of uh, just a way to give yourself an idea of, of how you're doing. Um, uh, use it as as a method maybe to decide how to allocate future studying efforts across the courses, for instance. Right. So I mean you only have a certain hour number of hours in the day and you don't want to study all the time it's important to, to relax and rest uh but within you know given a certain number of hours you're studying you want to choose optimally among the courses so you can think about the finals as a way to to make that choice too okay um all right so let's let's jump into the slides here so i guess um i mean i got so i got the slides here i guess i'm going to maybe go back and forth a little bit between slides and and uh, whiteboard Okay, so, but just to kind of review, you know, we're, we're thinking about, okay, so it's basically the, the stochastic processes lecture. This is really a bonus lecture. Um, I don't think I'm going to put, I don't think this is going to be on the exam or the prelims. So like, you know, pretty much kind of stuff that's on the exam ended with, with the creative destruction model, right? Um, if we have time next week, or not next week, if we have time on Wednesday, I might go over an extension to the creative destruction model called Cladin Cortum that incorporates the notion of firms that have multiple product lines, which is a thing that we see in the real world. Um, but that, that's that's going to be another sort of bonus. Um, but I think, but in terms of like the core stuff, sort of like you know, it's, it's expanding varieties and creative destruction. Okay, and then and all the other variants thereof. So I think um, uh, karaoke Wednesday. Will there be karaoke Wednesday? You know, we're running out of time. That's the last lecture. Um, we might have to do it. Let me think. Let me think about a song. I mean, uh, you know, I do like when I'm in karaoke. Uh, what's that song from? It's an Aerosmith song. It was in Armageddon. Uh, you know, don't want to close my eyes and so on and so on. Um, Dream on. No, it's not Dream on. That's another Aerosmith song. Don't want to miss a thing, right? Could do don't want to miss a thing. Not going to be pretty, but I could do it. Um, okay, okay, that's that's an idea. Uh, we want to keep these things like roughly PG thirteen rate, rated here, you know. But yeah, that can that can be a thing. Um, yeah, so let's 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 think on that. I'll think seriously about a song that I could sing, or that we could sing, or that someone could sing, without too much pain you know, externalities in this world right that's all that like karaoke is all about externalities you, you want to enjoy yourself but you don't want to ruin other people's night right you know so uh it's all about managing those things okay um yeah so i'll i'll, I'll mull it over you guys mull it over too all right we don't have to yeah so so let's let's do that on wednesday okay um and then uh and i won't yeah, when I put, I'll, I'll cut that out when I put it up on YouTube, so you don't have to worry about the the world seeing that, right? Um, uh, okay, so so that should be fun. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, uh, what was I saying? I forgot. Uh, probably something about stochastic processes. Um, 
oh yeah i was talking about kind of yep the the stuff stuff that's later like fair game okay so stochastic processes not fair game but very interesting i think it could be useful for a lot of stuff it's it's uh it's a good if i mean if you want to have stochastic elements to your models especially idiosyncratic idiosyncratic features for an agent or a firm if you want to have that it's a good kind of thing to have in your tool belt uh because you can do stuff pretty tractably okay so uh it's getting it's pretty popular in, in uh certain areas of macro and continuous time uh so I, I keep keep this in the back of your mind when you go for as you go forward through your graduate uh school years okay so yeah you got this brownian motion so so essentially the the takeaway from last time was that we're constructing these processes. You can think about them as, as discrete limits. You, you take a bunch of draws from some distribution, which is could be normal, could not be normal, okay? You take a bunch of those draws and uh, um, and then you, you kind of add them up, okay? Or you, you what you do is you take the draw, you scale it up by delta t squared. No, square root of delta t. Not delta t, but the square root of delta t so that the variance goes up. Uh, uh, linearly in time and hence is additive and separable across time. So you, you take those draws, you, you scale it up by the square root of delta t, and then you sum them all to, you, you do the cumulative sum. Okay. That's what you're seeing here. This is using a, a Gaussian driving force that for those z, little z shocks that we're adding up. That's Gaussian. This is using the Cauchy um, driving force. Okay. So, um, and you can see there's a big difference here, and the difference is that this Cauchy is not Cauchy driving force is not well behaved. It doesn't have uh, thin tails, and I think it might even be not. I think it might not even have a mean or, or well defined moments. Which once you do that, I mean you're already screwed. But so the Cauchy distribution is not well behaved, but yeah, it kind of looks cool. Um, so uh, let me. Okay, if someone was raising their hands in the past minute, I might have missed it, but I don't think anyone was. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so that's that's a basic idea. Uh, you can, uh, if you want, um, you can simulate this stuff. So I, you know, I generated this with, with you know, just simulating in Python. So, but we can look at other stuff. So I was, I was cooking up some simulations here. Let me make sure that this is all well and good. Um, how do I? Okay, so let's. Where is the grad macro? Okay, so. Um, Okay, cool. I just want to make sure I'm not, my face isn't covering what I'm talking about. Okay, so if you if you uh, this is just a little bit of Python here. Um, so all, all we're going to do is say um, we need a time period over which we're thinking about this. Let's just do zero to one. Doesn't really matter um, in particular. Okay, um, and let's do n is our number of time steps. Okay. So there, let's let's start low. I was going to start low and go go higher and higher. Okay, so we only do ten time steps. That's relatively small. It's going to give us a pretty kind of clunky looking graph. Delta is just t over n, t over the number of time steps. Okay, and then I have these different possible distributions that I'm defining. Okay, so let's I'm going to comment these out. Let's just do let's do the easy one, random normal, the Gaussian. That's what randn is, the Gaussian. So we're going to generate a bunch of Gaussian. This function will give you like n Gaussians if you ask for it. Okay. So first, we're going to define time as just a, a grid from zero to one. That's un, unexciting. Then we're going to say, okay, give me n of these this di from this distribution. Okay, scale that up by the square root of delta. Okay, and then do the cumulative sum. Okay, so just what I was saying in code. All right, then plot that, and you plot that, and it doesn't look like what we saw in the slides, and and. Part of the reason, well, the main reason is that n is 10. Okay, that's really small. Okay, so we can start pushing n up. Okay, that looks more like a real series. Okay, uh, now we're getting we're getting good. Let's go to 10,000. Let's get another one. Okay, you can see now it's got that sort of fuzzy fractal look going on. The, the reason it's fuzzy is that if you zoom in, it's there's still a lot of detail going on in the the, the fractal nature. Okay. Um, that's 100,000. I mean, you're not going to get much more than that with this. Uh, pixel density that I'm streaming at here. So um, yeah. So then, uh, okay. So that's that's using normal though, and we kind of know, we we know more than that, right? We know that if you if you if you choose a well-behaved distribution, then things things are fine. Okay. So 
let's choose this is a random uniform okay now you can't just give it the random uniform because remember it needs to be uh mean zero so we need to subtract a half so now this is uniform from minus a half to a half okay uh if we do that same thing basically you keep generating these they just have that sort of that it's a that brownian motion look to them right um so that's cool that's kind of like i mean we could look at um you know a histogram of changes from time period to time period and and we would see that it's normal for instance right and i mean like there's really no reason why we can't do that actually so if we look at um the difference of that okay then what's going on here oh yeah no sir we can't look at the difference the difference is still from every single time period to every single time period is still uniform but if we were to aggregate it looking for a difference from say zero to point one or uh from zero to one over a longer time interval then it would start looking more normal because then the central limit theorem starts kicking in so well that would be more complicated i'm not gonna waste your guys time trying to to figure out exactly how to code that correctly but if you aggregate over multiple time steps or hundreds of time steps for instance then it's going to start looking normal because of the, the the usual central limit theorem okay all right then you might think okay well that Uniform is still a symmetric distribution, but you can give it weird distribution. You can give it like the exponential minus one. So that's like bounded at minus one and has unbounded support. Positively, it's super asymmetric, but it still has mean zero and it has uh, well-defined moments and tails. You can do that, you still get the same thing. Okay, so there are different convergence properties for different distributions, but it, you know, with 100,000 points, it's gonna converge. Um, and you can see it still looks the same. Okay, so in case you didn't believe the proof, or not the proof, but the statement of the, the result at least, uh, the central limit theorem holds, okay? And it continues to hold in this Brownian motion setting, okay? So, um, yeah, and then I guess you, got, you can also see, um, let's say I wanted to give you that Cauchy, so Cauchy is apparently not a thing. Um, there's another name for it, I think. I don't know. There's another name for it. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Otherwise, I'll just give up and we can move on. Lorentz. It's also called the Lorentz with a T. Let's see if that exists. Well, that's not a thing either. So, um, standard Cauchy. Let's try that. This is probably not going to work, but you know what? Oh, actually, it kind of worked. See, you can see you get that funkiness. Um, this has sort of a drift that's weird. Okay, so this might not be 100% right, but you can see central limit theorem breaks down when you throw in that Cauchy because you get these periodic gigantic jumps, okay? Like this one, for instance, uh, or maybe smaller ones, but you get these discrete jumps, okay? Um, and essentially, that's uh, that's kind of a reflection of this some stuff, this work that Levy did, um, the, the same guy who's who's got that uh, Levy flight named after him here. Okay, so uh, essentially, you can show that you can basically break down any any sort of well reasonable stochastic process into sort of a Brownian motion component and then a jump process component. Okay, so you can break down this thing into like when things are normal, like in here, you know, and then like occasional jump processes, like a Poisson process is a jump process, right? Because it'll periodically it'll just sort of you'll you'll get a jump. Okay. Um, you know, like with creative destruction, right? When you do the innovation, that's that's a Poisson process that will that would look like jumps if you looked at the cumulative number of innovations. Okay, so that's what we're talking, and you you can decompose stochastic processes into that kind of stuff. Okay, so um, cool. Uh, so then, um, so then this is just the statement of the central limit theorem. Okay, which is as you. Um, Let's see. Yeah, as you know, as, as you add these things up, okay, um, they're gonna look like a, a Gaussian with with mean zero and variance uh, t, where t is the amount of time elapsed. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and there's some interesting stuff if you go to higher than three dimensions. Things get weird. Um, I'm not an expert on that by any means, but it, but there's some cool uh, results when, when you start thinking about higher dimensions, okay? Um, which is which is essentially like 
things get really the, the the volumes get really big and so you lose this recurrence notion that remember i said that dube single crossing lemma that you'll return to any you'll cross any threshold at some point in the future for any finite threshold uh you know that sort of breaks down in higher dimensions because the volumes get so large okay um all right so then okay so now we can talk a bit okay i'm, I'm not going to give you like the full-on formal proof here but but if we want to think about these stochastic processes one useful thing to tool to use is this characteristic function so i don't know if they if this was covered in econometrics okay um but it's it's kind of useful here, okay? And, and it also is essentially it's sort of an intuitive way to look at the the central limit theorem. But in general, it's also a way to, as its name implies, characterize uh, what, kind of what a process looks like and how it's moving around, okay? So, um, yeah. So I guess, yeah. I mean, I guess we could just we could just go through. Um, I'll go through this on the slides. I won't write everything out, okay? Essentially. You can define this characteristic function, what I, we're, we're going to call phi sub x. So x is a random variable. So so we're not even really. This is this is just a general random variable. We're not we're not um, bringing this to the time series dimension yet. But if you just have some general random variable x, you can define this characteristic function as the expectation of of e to the i t x. Okay. So the characteristic function now is a function of this other variable, this new variable t. Okay, which controls the uh, the frequency basically going into this. So remember, e, e to the i t x, that's like i sine plus co e to the i x is i sine x plus cosine x, right? So or maybe it's flipped around, but one of those wherever the i goes. So it's it's an oscillating function, okay, in a complex space, okay, and then t is controlling the rate of oscillation, okay, um, and so what you do is you just you you can you can characterize it in sort of probabilistic terms as the expectation of the exponential of it times this random variable x or you can just write it out as an integral i mean you just throw in e to the itx and then you integrate over the density of that uh random variable f of x okay so we're just this is like this should really be like a triple equals here so we're, we're defining this notion of a characteristic function now if you've seen Fourier transforms before this should look pretty familiar okay this is very similar to Fourier transform in the sense that it's a spectral decomposition okay um uh, I guess, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's there's some factor of two pi. I mean, this is slightly different, but it's it's up really up to a constant. But at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're, you're you have this frequency t, and you're integrating over the the density to pick up things of that frequency, right? You, you're going to pick up things of frequency t when you do this integral, okay? And that's that's what this is doing. So it's very similar to a Fourier transform, um, and this. And the similarities include that it's got this sort of convolutional exponential form. It has an inverse transform where you just put a minus here on phi and you'll get back what you started with, okay, with a factor of 2 pi um, and uh, stuff like that. So so we'll see it basically is, is the analog of the Fourier transform, okay? So the cool thing about this, okay, is um, you can... You can also sort of characterize the moments of a distribution in terms of this thing, okay? So, uh, in terms of this function, in terms of this analytical object, okay? So it's it's not, it's definitely an analytical object. It's not something that's readily storable. Like this is storable in a computer. Phi of t, you could calculate this integral for any give for a bunch of t's and map it out. But once you start taking derivatives, that's a little bit more complicated. But you can express the derivative, uh, sorry, the the moment. Uh, the the non-central moment for x, so the expectation of x to the n is the nth moment for x, uh, as this uh, derivative evaluated at t equals zero. And essentially, like if you think about taking a derivative of this thing, every time you take a derivative with respect to um, t, okay, you pop off an i x, right? You just pop, with respect to t, it doesn't show up here. It only shows up here. You're just popping off i x's. So you're going to get i x to the n if you take n derivatives. Then you kill off those i's because you don't care about those. And uh, and then you're left with something. And the last thing you have to do is just evaluate it at 0, right? So that 
this thing just disappears and you're just integrating x to the n time f times f of x, which is the expectation of x to the n. Okay, so if you think about it, you take n derivatives, kill off the i's that you're generating, take and then, then just evaluate at zero so this thing doesn't actually show up. Boom, you got it, you got yourself a moment. Okay, so that's that's the characteristic function. Um, if you've seen moment generating function, that's just uh, the the moment generating function is well you just evaluate this at i t so you or minus i t so you kill off the i okay so um yeah but it's the same idea okay so um so that's a characteristic function okay it's it's a it's a general concept for for random variables uh you can the the thing that's really useful about it which is which is also exactly analogous to a fourier transform is this uh is this spectral convolution property which is that Okay, so what it, first of all, what is convolution and, and why is it useful? Okay, so convolution is when you take two functions um, and you kind of integrate them with some offset, okay? And, and the main application here is we want to know what happens when you add two functions together, okay? Uh, so if you have two random variables, x and y, and you define z to be their sum, x plus y, uh, and you want to talk about the distribution of z, well... You can just, you, if you want to think about what's the distribution of z, well, you kind of, there's a bunch of different ways to get a particular z. You could have small x and large y. You could have small y and large x. You could have kind of medium values for x and y or anything in between. So what you do is you say, okay, well, let's say x is something. And if x is something, then, z, then y has to be z minus x, right? So y would be z minus x. Uh, so you're just integrating over like what x was and then using what y had to be to get the, that particular z and then you just do that integral. Okay, so this is what a, a convolution will look like. You just have to make sure you have that offset here. Okay, so it's a function of z and you're integrating out variation in x. Okay, you could also characterize it in terms of y and z minus y, right, but it's equivalent. So, so that's a convolution there. Now what you can show is that <clears throat> in this spectral space, this characteristic function space, this is no longer an integral. You just multiply them together, point but point wise multiplication. Nothing more than that. Okay, so if you want to know that uh, characteristic function of z, just take characteristic function of x and y, multiply them together point wise for each t, and that's that's your characteristic function. Okay, and so you, you could, you know, one useful uh, uh, one use of this. It would be, for instance, to calculate uh, this integral, right? If you didn't, for some reason, want to do this integral directly, you could find the characteristic functions of x and y, multiply them together, inverse characteristic function, what you get out, and you'll have f of z, right? Now, you have done three integrals just in the place of one integral there, so maybe that's not efficient, but uh, sometimes it actually can be for various reasons, okay? So... That's the idea. Um, okay, so you can you can so we've established that there's this notion of a characteristic function. It kind of generates moments by taking derivatives, and it also makes convolutions easy. Okay, those are the the main takeaways here. Okay, um, and okay, so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use those properties. And, and basically, you can use those properties to give like a really kind of simple informal proof for for the essential limit theorem, okay? Which is which is basically what we have here, which is that the Gaussian distribution is sort of a basin of attraction in the space of probability distributions, okay? Uh, that when you keep adding them together, you kind of tend towards the Gaussian direction, okay? Um, and so, so the kind of the first. Uh, we're going to need one, we're going to note one result, and then we're going to just do the do a direct calculation, okay? So uh, first result is, um, if you think about the Taylor expansion of the characteristic function, okay? This, you know, phi of phi sub x of t is equal to the value around zero, we're expanding it around zero, is equal to the value at zero plus t times the derivative at zero plus one half t squared times the second derivative at zero, and so on and so on. And in general, it's you know, one over n factorial. 
right? So, so think about that Taylor expansion, and then think about those derivatives at zero. Well, those are basically just these moments, right? These nth derivatives at zero with an extra i factor, basically. Those are basically our, our, dis our distribution moments, okay? And so we can plug those in. Like, let's say we knew those moments somehow. We could plug those in for the derivatives, okay? So what we're doing here is we're just taking that Taylor expansion and plug it. instead of putting a derivative here, we just have that moment, and then we just have this extra i to the n factor that shows up, okay? So essentially, using that moment property, you can re-express the Taylor expansion as a sum of the moments of the distribution, okay? Um, so it's it's just shuffling around algebra and noting different identities, but it's it's true. Okay. So, okay, and that's that's going to be useful uh, if we do know something about the moments of the distribution. And for instance, we might say that the distribution is standardized in the sense that it has uh, mean zero and uh, variance one. Okay. So so that's what we're going to assume, right? And so what does that mean? Um, okay. Well, that means that. So like, let me pop over to the, is this, is this the right thing to do? That's the slides, that's the whiteboard. Okay, so if I pop over here, right, so you can write phi, that's a phi by the way, that's a t, okay, is gonna be, uh, that's still a phi, um, uh, this thing at zero, okay. Um, and then plus uh, t times, uh, I guess, well, we can just call it phi, phi prime x of zero plus one half t squared phi prime double prime x of zero plus some other stuff that we don't care about. Okay, that's the same. That's just the, the equation on, on the top of the slide from, from, from the slides just a second ago. Okay. Um, all right, and so then this is going to be what? Well, uh, man, okay, someone is like calling the hell out of me. Let me see if it's actually important. It looks really not that important. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so, so what does that mean? All right, so, so if we think about um, evaluating at zero, okay, well, you, you kind of always just get one at zero, regardless of what the distribution is, okay? Because it's the expectation of e to the i times t times x, right? And if t is zero, it's just the expectation of one, which is one, okay? The, there's no, the x doesn't show up at all, okay? Um, the next one, okay, so that's gonna be t times, remember we, show, we, we argue that this is just that first moment the expectation of x, okay? All right, and then the second one is one half t squared times the expectation of x squared, okay? And then, you know, one sixth t cubed expectation of x cubed and so on and so on, All right? But we're gonna call it off at there, okay? So then, and then in our case, we've said that <clears throat> we're assuming that the expectation of x is zero, and the expectation of x squared is one, okay? So that makes this simpler too. So it's one plus zero uh, I forgot we need an i squared here too because that pop, we need to adjust for the i squared, okay? So then this one you get a, that i squared gives you a minus one so that's minus one half t squared. That's the minus one and then x expectation of x squared is one, okay? Um, all right, and then so, you know, plus some other stuff that we don't care about. So it's approximately equal to one minus one half t squared. If it's, if it's stand, if it's a standard variable, <clears throat> uh, yeah, if, if it's a standardized variable, so it has mean zero and variance one, uh, and it has, well, you need it to have finite moments for these higher order things for 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 this to to kind of wash out we need finite higher order moments too we need a well behaved distribution okay uh and then the only thing we need is that t is relatively small okay because this is a taylor approximation around zero so we need t to be relatively small once we have that then our characteristic distribution it just is one minus one half t squared plus plus some, some uh less important terms okay
All right, so let's go back to the slides and see how that pans out. All right, so if we think about that here, okay, because you can see that that's basically showing up with an extra factor, which we'll discuss. Okay, so what what do, what can we do um, <clears throat> in this case where where we're thinking about? Okay, so it's kind of cut off. We're we're thinking about uh, summing up a bunch of x's, okay, and then dividing by the square root of n, okay. And we're going to look at the distribution of this. Okay, this is the standard normal, the standard uh, central limit theorem statement is that you take some of all these x's, you divide by root n. Okay, uh, and look at that that distribution. Okay, now with this characteristic function, when you divide by a number such as root n, okay, you really are just you can just divide t by that as well. If you go back to the definition, if you want to think about the distribution of x over root n, okay. Well, you could just take this th same thing and, you know, like basically dividing by root n in the x term is the same as doing it in the t term. So if you want to scale a distribution, you just evaluate it at t over root n. Okay. If you want to think about the distribution of x over root n, just evaluate the, the characteristic function for x at t over root n. And that's how you scale things. Okay. So then what we're saying is, okay, we want the distribution of z, the sort of pseudo average of all these x's. And from the uh, convolution theorem, right? So the convolution theorem said the sum of two is is the product. The extension of that is the sum of n is just the the, the product of all those n phi's. Okay, so we're we're taking the product of a n different identical independent variables. They should be independent, by the way. Um, and then we're and then we're we're looking at phi of x at t over root n because of that scaling. Okay, so there's t over root n because of that scaling by root n, and then there's n of them. Okay, and then uh, okay, so then that result we had about it being approximately equal to one minus one half t squared. Okay, that's that's what we see here. So one minus one half t squared, but now t is t over root n, so it's t squared over n. Okay, so it's one minus one half t squared over root n. All right, raised to the n. Okay, so this is a funny object in the sense of it's like. It's like one minus something that gets smaller and smaller with n, but raised to a higher and higher power. Okay, so it's like what's inside is getting closer to one, but then it's getting raised to a higher power and it's less than one, by the way. So it's getting pushed down. And so like, what's the net? Well, it turns out that that's, that's just another definition of, of the exponential. Okay, you see this limit a lot where you have these two competing forces and the, the, the net result is that it turns into an exponential function. Okay, um, so sometimes it's... it's uh, it's characterized as like one plus epsilon raised to the one over epsilon, okay? But one minus epsilon raised to the epsilon is, is gonna be the same, so uh, with a minus sign, okay? So you're gonna get e to the minus one half t squared, okay? In the limit, all right? So, well, okay, that, that's kind of cool, but what does that mean? Well, well, it turns out the last step, I'm not really gonna prove, but you can show it, uh, is that this here, this characteristic function corresponds exactly to the characteristic function for a standard normal. Okay, so remember here, for 5x, this didn't have to be a standard normal. This could be anything that's well beh well behaved. Um, this is converges exactly to a standard normal. So, and if you have the same characteristic function, you have the same distribution. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, so, um, yeah. So essentially, we've shown that this thing converges to standard normal. Now. That means that the variance, uh, let's see. Yeah, that, so that means that the, the variance of these x's is, is, is n, okay? Uh, I mean, so, so if, you, if you apply this to our Brownian motion setting, that basically gives you that the variance uh, from looking from time zero to time t is gonna be t itself, okay? That's kind of the same thing. Um, Okay. All right, I figured out someone, someone was calling me like three different times and it turns out that it's some scam trying to convince me that I need to give them money. Not gonna give them money, all right? Um, okay, so that's 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 really just a central limit theorem, but the central limit theorem is what gives us Brownian motion, so I figured I'd throw it in for the hell of it, okay? Um, okay, so then that's good. It's largely theoretical, but that's good to know. 
that, the, that those things are out there. Okay. Um, and, and the other good thing to know is that even if you kind of break the central limit theorem by putting in like a Cauchy distribution, there's still the Levy fallback, which is that it, it's going to look like a Brownian motion plus some process that occasionally jumps, but not all the time. Right. So you're, you're not totally screwed if, if you have a, an unusual driving distribution, you just get sort of a Brownian motion plus a jump process, basically, or, or a, some combination of various jump processes. Okay, so you're you're not you're, you're you, you can still do stuff in the in the more general sense in the more general case. Okay, um, okay. So now let's think about okay. So that that's basically Brownian motion. Now we can think about kind of uh, operationalizing this. Okay. Um, into something maybe we could use uh, in in a macro or econ setting. Okay, so uh, kind of the first the first thing is is you know how to what what kind of notation should we use here? Okay, so usually with the way they write it in uh, kind of the stochastic process literature in, in terms of their notation, they, they write it in terms of like um, a, a differential. Okay, so it's like kind of. Not quite a derivative, but but a not quite a delta, but it's like a continuous differential. Okay, so the differential here, dxt. So that's, and um, I guess I'm also writing sub t instead of of t. But this this is time, by the way. This is not the other t before. This is just saying the some random process x at time t, and this d says it's the differential that change the infinitesimal change at time t. Okay, that infinitesimal change is going to be uh, well. For, so you have this. Let's talk about the Brownian motion. This is the, the Wiener process, Brownian motion. That's saying this this differential and that Brownian motion at time t. So this is like in the discrete case, this would be delta square root of delta t times st some standard normal. Okay? That's what this would be if you were like simulating it. Okay? And this would be delta t, which we'll see in a bit. This dt would be delta t. This would be square root of delta t times some standard normal. So it's not, it's not delta t times the standard normal. It's the square root of t. That's the that's the big difference here is that you can't just be like adding up standard normals. You have to use that square root of t or else things go nuts. Okay, and that the reason you use delta t is because we found for the Wiener process that the variance scales with t. Okay, and hence the standard deviation, which is what you multiply by scares, scales with square root of delta t. Okay, so that's that's important, especially once you go to simulation. Um, then you have the overall variance of the Brownian motion. So, so, so here, I'm, I'm using Brownian motion and Wiener process interchangeably here, by the way. So the overall variance, I mean, there's the variance sort of from time to time, but then there's also, uh, you know, if you look at those graphs that I showed before, you could just multiply them by two and you've scaled the variance, okay? So, so there's also an overall variance that's not time dependent, it's just sort of like the fundamental variance, okay? And that's just, well, this is, that's just a standard deviation really, sigma uh, that you multiply that by. That scales up like normal, like a normal uh, distribution kind of thing. Um, okay, so that's the, the Brownian motion part with this new sigma parameter controlling kind of how much variation there's happening over time. And then, uh, then there's this mu. So mu is the drift. Okay, this is just saying you go up or down if mu is negative at rate mu. Okay, so if there was no Brownian motion, you could divide this and say dx dt is equal to mu. Okay, that it's just a linear function. Uh, but then once you add in Brownian motion, obviously it gets more more interesting. Okay, so um, so that's the notation, and then basically the two important things are the drift and the variance sigma. Okay. Now, well, this is all good, but the problem with this is it's going to be non-stationary because of that drift. Okay, I mean it's going to be non-stationary for two reasons: one, you've got drift; two, you've got essentially a random walk. Remember, the Brownian motion has no no return force; it just goes out and diffuses, and it ends up going everywhere all the time. But like, it's it's essentially a random walk. Okay, um, so that that first line x is just going to drift away and have infinite variance and everything like that. So that's not ideal for our purposes. 
Uh, usually we think about stuff as sort of moving around a space, but eventually kind of getting pushed back if it deviates too far, okay? Uh, and so we can incorporate exactly that force, okay, um, with what's called this uh, ornstein ullenbeck process, okay? Which is a really complicated name for just throwing in a, a, a mean reversion term, in my opinion. But I guess they probably did other stuff. Uh, so this is like the analog of an AR1 in continuous time, all right? So what this is saying is you still have... Um, so now mu is kind of recast, okay, as as the central point, the the, the point of convergence for this series, um, and so what you do is you say, so how how are we moving around today? Well, uh, let's think about mu. That's our sort of reference point. That's what we we tend back towards, and then we think, okay, how much higher are we than mu? If we're higher than mu, so x is greater than mu, then we're going to get pushed down. If we're lower than mu, so x is less than mu, we're going to get pushed up back to mu. Okay, so it's just a pure convergence force here. This minus sign on x means this is it's a stable convergence kind of thing. All right, that's all deterministic for, multiplied by dt. Then you throw in the Brownian motion. Okay, so if without Brownian motion, you would just converge um, linearly to mu and then stay there forever. With the Brownian motion, then you go up and down, you can you go around, but you always come back sort of to the neighborhood of mu, okay? You, not only do you come back, but you, you you spend most of your time there, okay? So with the with the pure Brownian motion, you also come back to mu, or to zero rather, but you also go like everywhere else and you're kind of chaotic. Not like chaotic formally, but like, you know. Uh, whereas with, with the Orange Chain and back, you actually spend a good amount of time in the neighborhood of mu, okay? So that's, yeah, so so those are important, especially that Ornstein, Ornstein on back as, as it's an analog of the, the very uh, widely used AR1 or ARN uh, processes, okay? So, um, yeah. Okay, so then the other thing is adding in these discrete jumps that I was talking about before. You could do that, okay, if you want to. Um, uh, you just put in, you have a Brownian motion with variant sigma, and then you throw in this, this jump process, which you call DJ. Okay. And the, the, but the thing about DJ is that it's kind of weird in the sense that it's, it's most, almost always zero, but then occasionally it's huge. Okay. So the notation uh, is a bit odd because this differential would be sort of infinite in a sense, but, um, over it. like if you calculated like the slope, it would look like kind of infinite, but in, in differential terms, it's just a number. Okay, so, uh, but but that that would look like those jump processes that we saw with the Levy flight when you had a Cauchy-driven uh, uh, Levy flight. Okay, we're not going to do too much with that, but but you can write it using this notation. I guess is the main thing. All right. Okay, so that's cool. Um, so now we need we want to actually use this stuff okay and in particular we want to use it probably for valuing stuff and we might have a function that does that which we might call a value function um, and so we need to figure out how to plug this into a value function you know and, and we're gonna essentially gonna take that same discrete delta approach and take the limit and see what happens but it turns out that something kind of unusual happens and we get an extra term okay so we'll see that all right so let's do um, let's go on the whiteboard. Let's do this. Let's do this the old fashioned way. Whiteboard. Which one's the whiteboard? Number three. Yeah. Okay. Got my hotkeys, but I forget them. All right. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so we're thinking about, so this is, this is going to be called Ito's Lemma. Okay. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's kind of weird. It's called a lemma. It's like a very widely used result, but I guess Ito is maybe he was a little, he was sort of like understated and he didn't, he didn't want to make too bold of a claim, but it's pretty damn important. Okay. So, um, so this is, this is, but what, it's essentially just kind of like showing you how do you incorporate this into a function? Okay, how do you incorporate Brownian motion properly into a function? Okay, and we're going to do like a simplified version of it. Okay, so um, so let's think about uh, okay, so let's have let's have X be our, our uh, stochastic process. 
Okay. I'll just do lowercase x instead of capital X. Um, and let's, and that we're going to define x kind of the way we did before. So dx, I'm going to drop t subscripts for a second. Okay. It's going to be mu dt plus sigma dw. Okay. So just some drift mu and some uh, Brownian motion with uh, uh, standard deviation sigma driving it. Okay. So that's going to look like, you know, this. It's going to have that drift mu, but also it's also going to have that Brownian motion. Okay, on top of it, All right? Now, um, so we can, uh, you know, if you, if you want to think about this in sort of capital delta terms, okay? So capital delta much less than one is our time step. Because how, how do we, like, what is this? How do we take take this to like the true discrete setting for, away from the infinitesimal case? Uh, so there we're going to say that x of t plus delta well, it's equal, first you got your base x of t. All right, this is like a persistent kind of thing. Um, okay, so the mu is easy. That's just delta mu. That's the same basic idea that we had before. If you have a derivative dt, it's just delta, okay? Um, now the, the z, remember, you gotta use the square root of delta for this, okay? So we're gonna say square root of delta times sigma times some z, which is an IID draw at every time period. Okay, so let's call that like Z of T. So Z of T is just pure IID at every T. Okay, so it's very, very simple. You take uh, normal, let's say, uh, then um, it doesn't actually have to be normal because of the the, the, the theorem we had about the Brownian motion, but it, let's say, say it is uh, times sigma times that scaling up square root of delta. Okay, so this, is how you discretize Brownian motion. This is in some sense the most important step is just to make sure you put a square root of delta here rather than a delta, okay? Um, all right, so that's good. Um, we, yeah, so and in terms of, yeah, so like for, for Z, we need expectation of Z is zero. Expectation of Z squared is one. It's the standard normal. Okay, so that's oops, standard normal. Okay, um, that's it. Okay, so now that's, but that's not Ito's lemma. Ito's lemma is coming up. So then the question is, how do we, how do we think about the change in a function that we're interested in? That's a, a function that's, well, X is kind of a function, but it's a stochastic process. We're thinking about like a V of X and even, it can have some t dependence, okay? How do we think about how this value function where we have a state variable x and time t, how does that change over time, okay? So uh, to do that, you know, we're, so, I mean, we could write out the, um, the sort of next step v, okay, is gonna be <clears throat> v evaluated at x of t plus delta, comma t plus delta. So we're incrementing x itself forward and also explicitly incrementing time forward. Okay. Um, all right, and so here, okay, so what are we doing? So let's just work it out term by term. All right, so first, it should have some relation to the original value, okay? So this is, a, this is gonna be an approximation here, but the, the approximation will make sense. Okay, so it should have some relation to the original value, V of X of T comma T, plus some other stuff, okay? So what's the other stuff? All right, so first, um, there's a simple one, which is delta times V dot X of T, T. So this is what we usually have, is that the, if you just had T, T was time and time moves with DT equals one in some sense. Uh, you just take the derivative and multiply it by the time step. Add that to the original value, boom, you're done. Okay, that's an approximation, all right? Um, that's a first order approximation, okay? And with time, you don't really need a second order approximation. And you could, you could have plus delta squared, uh, one half delta squared times V double dot. 
right? Remember, these are Taylor expansions. We could add in more time terms if we wanted, but we don't have to because we only really care about things of order delta in the end because we're going to we're going to ultimately divide by delta and take the limit okay so so we can ignore things that are of order delta squared uh or, or less okay so that's why we only have to take that first uh approximation uh, first order approximation okay and then we can do the same thing for uh we can do the same thing for x okay in the first order okay so we can do uh so it's going to be like delta x times v sub x, right? And remember, delta x is like this whole thing here, right? This is x of t plus delta minus x of t. This whole thing here, the drift plus the Brownian motion term is delta x, okay? So um, we can do that, all right? So we're going to, and, and then also remember that, that uh, delta x is stochastic because of z. All right, so this is going to look like delta mu plus square root of delta sigma z, okay, times v sub x, x and t, comma t. All right, right, so we just take delta x times vx, delta t times, you know, v dot, v, you know, the time derivative, okay. So this is the original plus any first order, phone won't stop, uh, plus any first order stuff. Okay, now we could stop here, say, okay, divide, think about how, how, what is the delta dependence here? This has a single delta to the one, that's good. This is a delta to the one here, that's good. Now this has a delta, a square root of delta, and when we would divide that by delta, we'd get a one over square root of delta, which actually explodes. That's rough. Um, but we also know that the expectation of Z is zero. So in fact, the expectation of Z will just kill this off before it, before it has time to go nuts with the one over root delta. Okay, so this this actually gets this gets, gets killed off here because of the expectation, because of this standard normal. And we would get, you know, for that differential, V dot plus mu V sub X, right? Um, and we could call it a day there. The only problem is to be wrong, okay? That's an issue because we're missing a term. We're missing a term in the sense that you need to keep going with your Taylor expansion until you've gotten all of the, the delta to the one terms sorted out. And if you miss a delta to the one term, then that's bad, okay? So it turns out, and so so in general, we don't have to worry, like or like before we didn't ever have to worry about that because if you look at the next term, it would just be all delta squareds, okay? But it turns out we're gonna pick up uh, we're going to pick up another delta term. Okay, so what's that going to look like? So the we're going to look at the second order term from this x differential. Okay, so it's going to be one half times that expectation of delta x squared now. This is that z, this whole thing squared. Okay, expectation. So, so this is really, um, this is really an expectation here, right? So we think expectation of this Taylor approximation, okay? So then the Taylor approximation happens and then we throw the expectation on top. So we get the one half delta x squared. We get a VXX here. Okay, and then we get that expectation on top. Okay, so that's what this is gonna look like. All right. Um, So now, if you think about this, some of these terms are going to be higher of order higher than delta to the one, but actually this L term, the last term here, you're going to get exactly a delta. That's that hidden delta term that gives you a V double X, okay? So, um, well, let's work it out, okay? So we're going to get what? We're going to get the base term. Okay, so this, this stuff is all the same. Uh, v dot x of t, t. And now we can start simplifying. Okay, so this is gonna be what? So the, remember this this thing here, the z has mean zero, so this expectation is gonna this it's gonna disappear in the expectation. So we're just about to have delta mu v sub x x of t t. Okay. Cool. Um 
All right, then now this term is you know going to have to to we need to multiply this out to be sure what happens, okay? And so essentially we're going to get you know three terms. We're going to get one half delta squared mu squared v x x. Okay, so that this term is of order delta squared. So we're that's going to disappear, even if we divide by delta. When we take the limit, it's going to disappear. Okay, so we don't need to worry about that one. Uh, the next one, you know, it's going to be two times one half, which is one. You know. Delta to the three halves, uh, mu sigma z. But actually, because it has a linear z, that that expectation again of z equals zero kills it off. Okay, so it's going to have a delta to the three halves, but also it gets killed off by the expectation of a z. So let's just not even write that. And then the last one, you get uh, delta. Remember, so delta square root of delta squared is delta here. Okay, and then don't forget the one half sigma squared. Okay, that's squared. Expectation of z squared is just one. Okay, so we get one there, and then vxx. Okay. Um, okay, so what does that all mean? Okay, so then if you, you know if, if you want to write it out like this. So essentially, we have three terms here that are sort of of order delta, and then one kind of delta squared term, which we're going to ignore. Okay, so we're going to say that it's it's roughly zero. Okay, so this is approximately equal to v of x of t t plus delta times all this stuff that we've de decided is is of the right order. Okay, so v dot mu v x. Okay, I'm going to write these explicit time subscripts one last time. One half sigma squared vxx. Okay, so it's just this, you know, the expect expected value of the value function of the next time period is the original value plus delta times this differential term, the time derivative, the drift term times vx, which is standard, and then this new variance term. This is the core of Edo's lemma, the core result, saying you get this extra variance term. Okay, so, and if you were to go to higher order terms up here, you know, everything would be at least delta squared, if not more. Okay, so, uh, or the, at least delta to three halves, which is good enough. All right, so this is, this is good enough for a first order uh, small delta approximation. Okay, so um, what does this mean? Well, it's, essentially this means that, um, you know, V dot makes sense, the change in time is going to induce changes in v if, if v is a function of t. Mu vx makes sense. That's the same as we've seen before. The change in mu, a deterministic change in mu, you just kind of weight it by the derivative, and that's how much your value is changing. Okay. Now this one is saying, okay, you've got some additional spread happening in addition to that drift. You've got some random spread that goes on top of that. Okay. Um, and it's it's really a reflection of Jensen's inequality, right? which is that you have, if you have concavity in X, okay, some additional spread, right, is going to be bad, right? That's Jensen's inequality in a nutshell. So this is just properly valuing all that stuff, saying, okay, well, the, the larger the variance of the spread, then the more bad it is. The larger the concavity of your function, the more bad that is, okay? It's also true that if Vx, if V was convex, then it would be good, right? That's the, that's the flip side of Jensen's inequality. So, but but in general, we're thinking about concave, so 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 it's it's gonna be that sort of penalty arising from uh, risk is bad when you have a concave objective function. Okay, so that's that's the rationale. It fits in with our I think existing uh, intuition. Okay, so um, okay, so that was a lot of work, but eventually we got kind of a cool thing. Um, okay, now we just, really it's just one or two more steps to take that into uh, talking about a value function, okay? So what is what would that be? So value function, we're, we're gonna take that approach we've taken before and say, okay, v of x t comma t is delta times u of x t. So we have utility arising from x um, 
I mean, you could have a T here too. Why not? Uh, some flow utility, U, okay. Plus a discounted, at rate row, let's say, uh, expected utility now, okay, of V of X of T plus delta comma T, right? So this is our expected utility. And now we know exactly what that thing is, that continuation expected utility. We got that, right? Um, and after that, it's just, just plugging stuff in, all right? So uh, what do we get? Okay, so we get this is the same, one minus delta rho. So we're gonna get, let's just break this up into two things. So first we're gonna get one minus delta rho times V X of T, T. Okay, this, this is approximate really approximately equal to um, here. Okay, so uh, I mean, and really, really this is this is approximately equal to too. Everything's approximate. Okay, so um, we're gonna get that V term here times one minus delta rho, and then I'm gonna jump down here. We're gonna get one minus delta rho times delta times this whole thing, okay? Uh, I'm not I'm not writing the dependence anymore. I've, this that that's that's the last straw. Okay, so all this x of t comma t that's implied, right? Uh, one half sigma squared x x. Okay, this is all evaluated at time t. Okay, um, <clears throat> okay, so then uh, we can we can do this. All right, so this is. Let's let's keep track of what we have here. So we're we're gonna have um we're gonna be able to cancel this one times v of x here, comma t, with the original one. This is a t. Okay. Because of the way we did that. All right, and then then we can move this one over. Why not? Okay, move the delta rho v over. So we're gonna get delta rho v. Okay, that we basically move this over. Cancel out the ones and then kept the delta is equal to delta u, let's say of x now. I'm gonna drop t's plus this this one here. We've moved this over and then we're left with one minus delta rho delta v dot plus mu x. Okay. We're almost there. Okay, so that's cool. Um, now you can see everything has a delta. Let's cancel the deltas. Rho V, U of X, here. Okay, this is all the same. Okay, and then, um, so now I'm taking this one step at a time here. The last thing, actually take the limit again this delta disappears. Okay, so then you get, you know, rho v equals u of x plus uh, v dot plus mu. So this should be like mu. Somehow I turned mu vx into just mu x, but let's, let's correct that. It's mu times the derivative vx. vx plus one half sigma squared the xx. Okay, so first, also these are sub x's here. Okay, um, okay, so that's pretty much it. I mean, now we take in the limit. Uh, you know, if you want, you can write it in that more familiar form. Rho v minus v dot is equal to u of x plus mu v sub x. Okay, plus one half sigma squared v double x. Okay, so this is it. Right, this is the 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 ultimate value function okay and essentially you know if you just ignore this last term it's what we have before rho v minus v dot is equal to your flow utility plus kind of dx x dot which in this case would just be mu times that derivative v sub x okay and now we get that additional term coming from the brownian motion saying oh well because of concavity and this variance that's induced there we're going to have a one uh a one half sigma square term. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay.
confused for a second. Now remember that this, if V is concave, then VXX is negative. So this would be a, we'd subtract, right? So if V is concave, this is a penalty to our value, okay? Which makes sense. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's, this is pretty much it. I mean, this is the big result. Now we know how to write value functions with Brownian motions. Okay, so, um, so we can uh, we can do stuff with that. All right. So, um, uh, I've got some more stuff that I can I guess I can prove next time. But you know, if you wanted to uh, kind of operationalize this, really, let's say you want to do like a neoclassical growth model, NCG. Okay. G neoclassical growth. Uh, if we want to do that, and you know, maybe we have some, uh, we have some production function. Okay, so let's say it's, let's say our production function is v of, let's say x is our is our still our random variable. Okay, and then it's v x, k. Now, um, so so remember. X is a Brownian motion. If we're, if we're saying that X is a Brownian motion, it's 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 got full support from minus infinity to infinity. It can go anywhere, and it will go anywhere. Okay, so that's a bit of a problem for productivity. So what we need to do is is make sure it's positive, and the way we do that is just say e to the x. Okay, now X is still Brownian motion, but now e to the x is our actual productivity, which is guaranteed to be positive. Okay, so it's like a log normal kind of thing. The log of this is is normal in the sense of it's a Brownian motion, okay? Um, times k to the alpha. Okay, so this would be our if we want to really bring this to 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 a proper <clears throat> uh, production function, that's what it would look like, okay? Um, all right, and then you can you know, you can define. Uh, let's say that you know you'd, you'd say like dx is equal to minus mu times x plus sigma dw. So this says x sort of is centrally located around zero, okay? I guess I guess really I should write kappa. Kappa is the thing that I had before, but it doesn't really matter. But you no, know, but kappa is, let, let's do mu. I'm gonna, I'm gonna abuse notation slightly here because mu was something else before, but mu is the mean reversion parameter. So this says if x is positive, then mu x is gonna push it down. If it's negative, it's gonna push it up. X is generally cruising around zero. Okay. Um, okay. This mu is just like super ugly. I need to, I need to just start from square one here. So so x x is cruising around zero, and mu is the the mean reversion parameter. Um, and then we can write the you know the value function. Okay. So you know it's going to look like uh, you know rho v. Did I include v dot? Um, you know, it's going to be like rho v is u of e to the x, k to the alpha minus investment, okay, uh, plus that derivative term coming from k minus mean reversion for, uh, sorry, mu x. minus mean reversion and then plus some uh, Ito's lemma term. Okay, so yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. So here I threw in investment, right? You're pulling investment out of output to make consumption and that it affects the evolution of capital, which looks the same with V sub K. Then we've got that mean, basically the X related terms are mean reversion and stochastic Brownian motion elements. Okay, so you can throw in, I kind of went through that quickly, but I, I'm gonna circle back to it next class. So you can put this in a standard neoclassical growth model and you just have that X is your the log of your productivity. So it's guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be positive. Then you got mean reversion and, and some stochastic element from Sigma and you're good to go. Okay, and you can, at least it's well-defined. You can simulate it. You can solve this differential equation on a discrete grid on a computer um, and it, it's all good, all right? So, so that's sort of the general process of, of operationalizing this sort of stuff, okay? So um, I'm out of time. Uh, I'll see you guys next class. 
I will put up some uh, practice problems with solutions for you guys to check out. But, you know, give them, give them a 100% full go-through shot before you look at the solutions. Uh, uh, that way you really kind of make sure you know you know what's going on. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll put those up tonight. And then I'll see you guys um, on Wednesday. All right. Last class, we'll do some karaoke. All right. Excellent. Uh, okay, we got a question. Not too much trouble. May you post the solutions on a separate separate? Yeah, let me. I'll do it on a separate. I'll put it up the same way I put up the the homeworks. So I'll have two separate documents. That way, you, you you don't you don't have to test your willpower to resist the urge to scroll down a little bit. Uh, but yeah, no, I'll put it. I'll put it in a, a separate document there. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot to put that up. So it's up on YouTube. They they have this processing time. Um, it should be public soon. I, I, I'm going to check like right, right now. I should be able to transition it to a, a public video now after they process it. So I'll do that. Okay, cool. All right. Later folks.